Red Rackham's Treasure is the twelfth adventure of Tintin by Hergé. The comic is a continuation of the previous Tintin story, The Secret of the Unicorn, and was released in daily segments from February to September 1943, via the Belgian newspaper Le Soir. 47 years after it was published, Red Rackham's Treasure was adapted into an episode of the 1991 animated television series, The Adventures of Tintin. While 18 of Georges Remy's Tintin tales were converted into two 20-minute episodes, sadly Red Rackham's Treasure was one of three Tintin volumes which were only transformed into one 20-minute episode, meaning less than half of the 62-page comic was used for this animated adaptation. So, how faithful was this adaptation? Let's spot the differences. Due to a news report that Tintin, Captain Haddock, and Snowy will soon be sailing off to fish for the treasure of pirate Red Rackham from Sir Francis Haddock's sunken ship the Unicorn, a dozen men turn up to Tintin's flat claiming to be descendants of Red Rackham and are thus entitled to a share of the pirate's fortune. Haddock frightens all the fraudsters away, causing them to trample Detectives Thompson and Thompson. In the adaptation, only Professor Calculus knocks on Tintin's door. I'd like to speak to Mr. Tintin, please. I'll get him. Hang on. He's gone? Oh dear. <sighs> Maybe another time. The hearing-impaired Professor Cuthbert Calculus has built a shark-shaped submarine, and insists our heroes use it for their nautical expedition. At the Professor's home, Haddock gets shredded by a clothes-brushing machine, and the Thompsons get headaches when Calculus demonstrates his wall bed. The Thompsons were not added to this scene either, and although the clothes-brushing machine appears, Haddock doesn't fall into it. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm sorry, Professor, but your machine won't do. For two? A two-seater? The shopkeeper, who Tintin and Haddock buy a diving suit from, warns them they will never find the sunken treasure. Haddock accidentally breaks a mirror, and fearing this shall put a curse on the voyage, he decides not to go. Tintin uses reverse psychology by telling the Thompsons Haddock is too afraid to go on the voyage, which naturally makes the easily agitated captain more determined than ever to set sail. Calculus arrives at the harbour with his dismantled submarine. Knowing his words will be futile, Haddock crosses out the shark logo on the box, but the professor still looks as if he doesn't get the hint. In the comic, Calculus hadn't brought the submarine with him, as he wanted to get permission first, which he doesn't get, but due to his deafness, thinks he has. The main change is that Haddock actually writes on the wall what the professor can't seem to understand. Detectives? Shh, don't say detective. We've gone undercover. Thompson and Thompson accompany Tintin and Captain Haddock on their nautical treasure hunt because Max Bird, the main antagonist from the previous adventure, has escaped custody, again, and may attempt to avenge himself against our heroes, a concept which never manifests. Thus the main purpose to the story the identical dimwits serve is pumping oxygen into the diving suit. They change into their sailor suits once on board the Sirius, but in the episode they are already in costume when they arrive at the port. Also in the episode, both Bird Brothers are said to have escaped. As the adaptation had a restricted amount of time, only one of the Thompson's many amusing antics was used for the episode. My air stopped! Something's wrong! He's turning on the line! Thundering typhoons! Why aren't you pumping? We're taking a rest. I'll give you a rest. Men that pump. Now! Thompson moments not included include chewing tobacco in the hope it would make them blend in as authentic sea dogs, only to both accidentally swallow the lump of nicotine, trying to correct Haddock's navigations, but the calculations they give would place them and the ship inside Westminster Abbey, 
having their toes clawed by a crab, pumping into the night because Haddock didn't tell them to stop, and having a turn at deep-sea diving, but forgetting to wear the weighted boots. The ship's cook angrily reports to Haddock and Tintin that food has gone missing from his kitchen, and Snowy is the chief suspect. Searching for the little dog, Haddock finds a crate of what he thinks is a bomb. In the comic, it seems quite over the top that Haddock would jump to such an explosive conclusion at the sight of steel plates. Thus, a ticking mechanism was added to the episode. The three changes to the sequence are the reason Haddock looks inside the box is because it is supposed to contain whiskey. Our heroes don't know what the steel plates are for, as there is no picture of a shark on the case. And as this scene takes place at night, they go back to bed and discover they have a stowaway the next day. A thief in our midst? Why the glutton! Gourmand! Greedy piglet! Professor Calculus is the culprit who stole a box of biscuits, a pillow and blanket from the Thompsons, and a bottle of whiskey from Haddock's cabin. He explains that the night before the voyage, he removed all the bottles of whiskey from a case on the quay, and replaced them with the parts for his submarine. Surely somebody would have questioned why there were dozens of whiskey bottles littered on the quay, and this also implies the Professor carried his dismantled submarine from his home to the quay, if it wasn't already packed into cases, as it was in the adaptation. In the episode, we see Calculus eyeing up a crane hook that is loading equipment onto the ship. It is never clarified whether Calculus deliberately disobeyed Captain Haddock because he is incredibly stubborn, or if he is as blind as he is deaf. I was hoping you could give me a cabin. I slept rather badly last night. A cabin? I ought to throw you overboard! You hear me? With a view of the sea. Delightful! Ugh. The Sirius has reached the position Sir Francis Haddock's parchments gave as the location of the island he lived on for two years, near to where the unicorn sank. When land isn't sighted, it occurs to Tintin that Haddock used the Greenwich Meridian for his calculations of the latitude and longitude, when Sir Francis would have used the Paris Meridian, thus the ship has sailed too far west. Changing their course to the east, our heroes find the island a few hours later. Before sighting the island in the episode, Professor Calculus tells Haddock that, according to his pendulum, they need to be further west. In the comic, Calculus doesn't produce his iconic pendulum that he uses for divination until a few scenes later. Are you sure your calculations are correct, Captain? Of course they're correct, numbhead! Exploring the small island, Tintin, Haddock, the Thompsons, and Snowy find a wooden idol of Sir Francis, presumably carved by natives, and a pandemonium of parrots. In the comic, they also come across some monkeys who pinch Tintin's rifle and almost shoot Haddock in the head. Upon tripping over the remains of a jolly boat, Haddock is happily convinced that Red Rackham's treasure is at the bottom of the sea. But in the adaptation, he is disappointed that they found no fortune on the island, and it is Tintin that assures him the treasure must be in the sunken remains of the unicorn. Well, blistering barnacles! Blistering barnacles! Blistering barnacles! Blistering barnacles! <laughs> the second largest section of the comic not added to the adaptation is a five-page sequence in which the propeller of the shark submarine gets caught in weeds, trapping Tintin and Snowy under the sea. Haddock and Calculus row out to rescue him by using an anchor to hook the steel fins of the submarine. This dramatic sequence was included in the British radio adaptation of this adventure, recorded in 1992. Pull! 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 Ah, thunder and typhoons and pride to what do you think I'm doing playing the cornet? <laughs> Tintin puts on the deep sea diving gear, allowing him to explore the wreck. He soon surfaces with a cutlass and a cross encrusted with gems. 
In the adaptation, instead of surfacing each time he finds something valuable and portable, Tintin sends each item up to the Sirius via a bucket. Haddock wants a turn, and becomes very excited when he finds a bottle of 250-year-old rum, which he instantly drinks to the last drop, then drunkenly dives back in, without his helmet. This funny moment does not happen in the adaptation. However, the consumption of rum still occurs, as the shark that attacks Tintin swallows a bottle. Well? They're just old documents. Ah. The largest section of the comic not added to the adaptation is a six-page sequence. Professor Calculus notices a large cross on the island, prompting Tintin to remember the last line of Sir Francis Haddock's message. For it is from the light that light will dawn, and then shines forth the eagle's cross. The five men and Snowy return to the island and start digging. But the larger the hole grows, the more Tintin begins to doubt Sir Francis would have left the treasure behind upon being rescued. Haddock becomes so enraged with the Professor that he stamps on his pendulum and almost impales him with a pickaxe. After a month spent exploring the waters of the Caribbean, our heroes give up the treasure hunt and return to Belgium. A reporter comes to find out all about the expedition, but Haddock gleefully tells him to interview Professor Calculus, which naturally leaves the man completely baffled. Meanwhile, the Thompsons tell the captain that to recuperate from all the pumping they've done, they are going to visit a friend who works on a farm. Calculus informs Tintin that according to the documents he recovered from the wreck of the unicorn, Marlin Spike Hall, formerly occupied by the Bird Brothers, is the family estate of the Haddocks. As the captain cannot afford to buy the mansion, the professor offers to buy it for him, as the government has given him a lot of money for the patent of his shark submarine. Inside Marlin Spike's cellar, our heroes finally find Red Rackham's treasure, hidden inside a stone globe at the feet of a statue of St. John the Evangelist. The two final alterations to this comic worth mentioning are that instead of the top of the globe springing off and smacking Haddock in the face, it slowly opens up on a hinge. Secondly, the identity and relevancy of the statue is not mentioned. Ha <laughs> ha! All's well that ends well, eh, Professor? No, thank you. Never between meals. No, no! I said, all's well that ends well! Without any doubt. Which reminds me of that old saying, all's well that ends well! Ha 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 